Es una alegría y un honor poder presentar a Monseñor Mario Well, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce the Monsignor Mario Iceta Gabriga Gorgescoa, the Archbishop of Burgos. And we've uh, spoken about the dialogue uh, between medicine and the anthropological vision. Monsignor Iceta is an expert in both fields. So therefore, what he's doing is he's going to summarize all of the things that have been mentioned until now. He's a doctor in medicine and surgery by this University of Navarre. In 1995, he uh, obtained his uh, doctorate. His degree, and uh, well, he then studied at the Juan Pablo II Institute uh, to study marriages and uh, family in Rome. In 1997, he uh, obtained a master's in banking management. And well, well, he has a very extensive CV, as you can see, but he also has uh, lots of knowledge. He was ordained uh, a priest in Cordoba in 1994. In 2010, he was appointed the Bishop of Bilbao, and since October the 6th, 2020, he was appointed Archbishop of Burgos. He's a member of the Subcommission for Family and Life of the Spanish Episcopal Conference, and since uh, March 2020, he's a member of the Executive Committee and of the Standing Committee of this Episcopal Conference, and he's also the founder of the Andalusian Society of Bioethic uh, Research, and also health science in Cordoba, and he's a member of the Royal Academy of Cordoba in the section of social policies and sciences, a member of the Academy of Medical Sciences of Bilbao, and uh, also a member of the Royal Academy of Medicine and Surgery of Seville. So, right, well, we are going to listen to what uh, Monsignor Iceta has to say with lots of hope. Well, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Well, the truth is, that starting off at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon is a problem, of course, because everybody has just had lunch and we are somewhat dazed. And uh, being the last speaker after such a dense afternoon is another problem, too, because oxygen and phosphorus in our brains is, uh, well, on standby. There's nothing left. But, well, but uh, I think that uh, this also has another advantage because I can um, mention what has been mentioned since yesterday until today and well I'm well I'll be speaking for 40 minutes and I won't be speaking for more than that but I would like to look into what the church has done in these issues especially as regards the natural recognition of fertility and where this issue comes from and uh, I wanted to know what kind of audience we have it's not the same thing to talk to philosophers or theologists than to talk to scientists I remember that when I migrated from medicine towards theology, the truth is that I found that it was very difficult to um, address abstract thought because, well, this was focused on gynecologists, uh, doctors, uh, matrons, etc., or midwives. And above all, I thought that I have to do is be a little bit more pedagogical because perhaps we're used to evidence-based medicine, we're used to seeing things, and perhaps uh, we find that it's difficult to move on to a completely different level. And here, what I'm going to say is how you can draw up a clinical record and how you can um, introduce a person on the clinical record. You put in the name gender, stature, weight, uh, triglycerides and PSA and so on and so forth. But I, well, well, but I've just been introduced and nobody said about my, my blood pressure or whether I have obesity or don't have obesity. They did say they gave for you, they haven't given you the physiological parameters of my person, but in any case, you, well, you said that I was ordained a priest and I was in touch with so-and-so, but medicine sometimes uh, deals with the what uh, according to physiological parameters, but we mustn't forget about the who. And sometimes, or many times, it said that there are no such things as diseases. There are sick people. And when you... Uh, go and see the hip of somebody in room 318, we're going to see Felisa Martinez who broke her hip. And when we, uh, when you enter a room, well, what you don't do is give me the parameters first. What you say, or what you ask is, how are you? How was last night? 
So that means that we have, have to move into another field. And I'm saying this because what we have to do is move on from fertility to what is fecundity. Because this afternoon people were talking about fertility, fecundity, and love. And I think that it's very good to define these concepts because I've decided to use this sentence that is the title that can be found in the encyclical on love that becomes uh, fertile. Because I think that we have to explain this uh, title because uh, love is always fecund because it has two characteristics. It has two inseparable elements. It's a way of behaving. It's like a fire that uh, gives light and warms you, warms you. So love is a u uniting force. It's a love um, establishes links. So, well, love links you to another person and love is always fecund. In other words, it always generates life. Even though the person is no longer fertile after menopause, a woman is no longer fertile, but her love is uh, fruitful or fecund. And there are people that even um, don't want to set that uh, fertility into motion, but they are fruitful or fecund. Well, Teresa of Calcutta, her love was very uh, fruitful. She didn't have any children, of course, but love is always uh, fruitful. And this is a very important thing because what we're going to see, we'll see what is sexuality. It's uh, the body language of love because um, in the last presentation given by Dr. West, when he said that in the body, the body uh, divinity shines uh, and revelation shines too. And it's true because sexuality is the human manner of loving, the human way of loving. And we'd also have to um, focus on such a complex word like love. Love, and here we have uh, experts in these issues in uh, theology and philosophy. Love is an analog um, issue or term, and love for your country, love for your work, that's also love. Conjugal love is a form of love, and then you have uh, love of friendship, which is also another kind of love, romantic love, um, polite love, and then in the history of theology, love appears like a passion or like an action, because, well, people were talking about falling in love and about love. And, well, falling in love is something that happens, and it's something that uh, one doesn't go looking for, and all of a sudden you've uh, fallen in love with somebody else. So it's a passion. But in any case, let's say that this was explained perfectly well by Dr. Rojas, and I would like to refer to his presentation. Love is like uh, being willing to surrender a life and to receive a life. And this is where willpower enters center stage. And this is why um, love is always uh, fruitful, because fertility is at another level. We're talking about the natural recognition of fertility in women, but nowadays there's a big fertility problem in men, too. And uh, many causes, uh, well, women don't become pregnant, doesn't have to do with the women and their fertility, but rather has to do with the fertility or infertility of men. So men and women um, are fruitful when they join up. Their fertilities generate life. They become fruitful. It's, uh, well, soil is uh, fruitful, but if you don't plant anything, it's not going to be fruitful. It's very fertile. You use lots of uh, fertilizer, but if there's no grain, there's no production. So, therefore, it's fertility of the man and the woman for it to be, for them to be a um, fruitful couple. I didn't know if I should start off with texts from the popes or if I should kick off with some general ideas. And I've decided to deliver a very general summary and say why the Pope, uh, why did he write Humane Vitae, which is where everything started. And yesterday, somebody spoke about the 1968 revolution. Humane Vitae was published in 68, and today it's uh, the anniversary of San Pedro de Tatina, who died in 68. So 1968 did bring about a change. And, well, this happens when anthropology changes in a radical manner. 
or the way that uh, we conceive human beings. And then in this revolution of 68, it wasn't only an issue of uh, rebelliousness, but the dimension of the human being changed. I've tried to give you two or three very basic brushstrokes. I'm going to kick off with something very generic and some brushstrokes that have been taken from the fabulous teaching of uh, these uh, of these uh, popes uh, from um, Paul VI and uh, Franciscus, and then I will try to justify what I said. These are things that I have not made up. In these, uh, well, 53 years of uh, teaching, it's uh, been absolutely exuberant in matters of this kind. As was mentioned yesterday, human nature, mm, let's say, um, Imits, imitates God. I remember when I was a young um, seminarist or catechist, at, uh, well, we had to explain God the Father because catechism books, they started off by saying, look, why don't you draw your father? Okay, you made a drawing of your father. And I remember a child, a child said, I don't want to draw my father. And why not, said I. Well, because my father hits my mother. He beats my mother and because my father gets drunk and because my father hits me, he beats me up. And if uh, you tell me that God is the father, I can't believe that. So in other words, we know uh, God through the body. And I still remember that Cardinal Scola spoke about uh, the love of God, and he said, well, the main issue here is uh, human love. And we were told yesterday by Dr. West is that the love of God uh, towards man is uh, like a spousal kind of love as a people. And God, God is a communion of uh, people because God is three people in one. It's a mystery, isn't it? The Father and the Son that love each other. And this love is so powerful and is so potent that what it does is generate a person, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the love of the Father and the Son. It's a communion of uh, persons in the community of God. So yesterday when we spoke about individuality and when we spoke about only one flesh, and it's, uh, well, as if God were in the human being. That is, uh, men and women are made in the image and likeness of God. And the Pope said that the men and women are images in the likeness of uh, God. Woman, woman on her own is, well, it's the relationship between men and women that really matters. And they will be united in only one flesh, in only one nature, in with several people. So it really makes your hair stand on end, because God has uh, addressed his uh, way of uh, being in our very poor flesh. And, uh, well, he always refers to love in people, because yesterday we spoke about individuality, individualism, but we are not individuals. We are persons which is much more than an individual. It's a way of being, a way of behaving. In other words, being a person means that I am totally uh, focused on somebody else. And it so happens that I can only reach my plenitude once I've surrendered myself to that person and uh, I have also received something in exchange. So let's say it's like living in somebody else. And we all know that spouses, those of you that are husbands and wives, you know that uh, part of your heart is uh, inside your spouse. And this is how God has uh, presented uh, his uh, existence in ourselves and has done so in a fruitful manner, in a fecund manner. And this duality between men and women is expressed at all levels. At a body level, we have uh, the corporality of uh, men and women, which are completely different. You know that a man, his sexual structure to penetrate and to donate, and women to foster life, to receive. And, well, let's not mention the psychological aspects with uh, psychiatrists and uh, people that deal in psychology. These are two completely different psychologists. No, they are better nor worse. They just uh, supplement each other. I can also guarantee, I can ensure that at a spiritual level, it's not the same thing when, as an archbishop, I have 29 monasteries in the archdiocese for masculine and 25 feminine. And it's very different. The psychology of a monastery with Clarissas is very different compared to Benedictines at Silos, 
with the men, with the monks. And you know that if you are husbands, you know that the psychology of men and women is different. And uh, well, the same applies to the spiritual level. But this is a, this is a wealth. It's a richness, if you want because reciprocity and uh, complementarity, because, well, they all have to do with God. And ultimately, we have sexuality, which is that uh, body language, the body language of love. And love is expressed uh, in a body manner, in a diverse manner, depending on the kind of love. I'm going to give you some example, we people, the science, so that we can understand. For instance, in our Western culture, And uh, I don't know, I seem to recall that the Archbishop of Nagasaki invited me to visit uh, Japan and people don't touch each other, they bow to each other all day long. And depending on how much you bow, well, you are more or less important. It's uh, great for your back. Well, it's not very good for your back, but in any case, I don't know. Here, they introduce us, we don't know each other. I'm not sure if we can shake hands or if we can just uh, clash fists, as it were now that we are in the pandemic and you when you are introduced to somebody you don't know you shake hands and you come across somebody that studied with you at university for instance uh, dr alfaro uh, a friend or a colleague you hug that person that's the sign of friendship and well somebody who's a relative and uh, has a close connection with you you kiss that person and you come across your bump into your mother or your brother or in the south I was in Cordoba for some years, and people kiss more than they do in the Basque country up north. In the Basque country, we I know that we are somewhat uh, shy, and which is the sign of uh, conjugal love? It's the surrender of the body. I don't uh, surrender my body to my uh, brother when I see him when I hug. In the Basque country, we brothers don't kiss each other or would be tremendous. I don't know if you enter a lift and somebody kisses you. Well, look, no, I'm sorry, you're getting it wrong. This is not our relationship. Or one goes home and you shake hands with your wife and you think, oh, something's going wrong. So each type of love has a specific kind of body expression. And this conjugal love is a very, very specific kind of love. And the sign is a bodily Uh, donation and body reception. In other words, I'm receiving and I'm donating myself to somebody else in a total manner so that uh, I can, we can become a unit in the flesh. And we, what we have is a communion of affect and we have a communion of life, a communion of projects. Although we are different and We do not melt one inside the other, but this is where this union appears. So this is why the human person and love are intimately expressed through the body, especially in the sexual dimension, in uh, intimacy. So this is why by making sex banal means that what we are doing is the same thing to the person too. And when you are only uh, trying to get a body that uh, satisfies certain basic needs, what you are doing is um, well, reducing the dignity of that person when you trivialize things. And as I say, well, the conjugal act is always an act of communion, of surrender and donation, which uh, is uh, has an irrevocable definitive dimension. I'm only surrendering my body to you. I'm only receiving, I'm the only one that's receiving your body. So when you surrender your body to a third party, the wound in that conjugal love is terrible because it shows that our love is unique and irrevocable. And the thing is that you surrendered to me your body and I surrendered my body to you. So as you can see, well, well, you saw this morning, but well, it's necessary to have an effective education so that men can integrate their impulses and their dynamisms in this uh, issue of uh, surrendering to and receiving from somebody else. And here we have several levels. Firstly, we have uh, the uh, level of uh, the most basic inclinations. In other words, we have the levels of the different affects and uh, the levels of passions. And, well, it's also about integrating the body and sexual dimensions so that we can uh, surrender and receive in life with another person. And this harmonic integration of all these uh, dynamic elements has a word that is called chastity. And people mistake this with uh, continence. 
because chastity means that I love uh, uh, to have everything perfectly uh, organized as regards surrounding myself. And chastity means that I do not um, have sexual intercourse. But chastity means that I have all of my pulsions and uh, passions under control. How important it is to control these things or these trends or these inclinations. Well, I'm going to give you an example, and I'm sure that you'll understand. These actions, where do they come from? Do they come from um, willpower, from intelligence? Where do they come from? Well, above all, from willpower. And this willpower that is uh, based on reason. And I said, okay, well, I want to do this. I have the willpower to do this, and I get it done. Although, what is it that um, could pose a serious problem in the case of this willpower? Well, effects that are not properly approached. And I'm going to give you an example that is a little bit sordid, if you want, but you'll understand very quickly. Well, somebody that uh, loves drinking, for instance, well, you know, well, you, they know that alcohol is uh, very uh, bad for them, and they know that they have their transaminases at a very high level. And they also know that they become violent when they drink, and they also know that they have tremors and they can't concentrate when they don't drink. They know that perfectly well. And you don't have to say, look, uh, don't drink because that's going to hurt you. They know that. So he wants to stop drinking. But what is their problem? Well, that their affects, their... Uh, everything is uh, closely rooted to alcohol, and what this this has an influence on their willpower, and therefore they have to drink. We somebody spoke about pornography too, about how harmful this is for uh, conjugal relationships. Well, well, there are people that are enslaved by pornography, and uh, well, this makes them feel nervous. It uh, produces sleeplessness, and uh, well, they know that this is the case. But, well, look, uh, stop visiting those websites, is what people say. Yeah, but what happened? Well, it means that these untidy passions uh, mean that he has to visit those websites. It doesn't have to do with the mind or with the brain. It doesn't have to do with your willpower, which is uh, very debilitated, of course. So you have to do something about your internal mind. And in the field of sexuality, this is what we call chastity. And and it could also be called temperance, or it could be uh, strength. Somebody that is in that condition could not address life. So virtue helps you internally to rearrange things. And, uh, well, responsible um, paternity or fatherhood says that in this uh, fecundity of love, the spouses collaborate with God's creative plan. And, in fact, the church has a title for spouses, which is beautiful, and that is that spouses are cooperators or ministers, ministers of God's creative action. So let's say that the Lord, the Lord God, situates us uh, to his level as a creator. And when the spouses uh, perform the acts of love and uh, well, God appears and it will, God becomes involved and a new um, being appears. And this is the tremendous gift, the wonderful gift of sexuality. So this is why I think that those of you that are addressing these issues, uh, that is uh, gynecologist and urologist, well, there's a much uh, more important thing involved uh, well, compared to a gastroenterologist because, well, we are, let's say that we are in a field where what we do is produce a new human being. And uh, what we do is uh, generate a very special dignity and a very special responsibility, too. And certainly, well, being responsible means uh, that one, one uh, should bring to planet Earth those um, beings that you are capable of generating. And by generating, what I mean, you have to generate persons. So this is why um, fatherhood and motherhood are not only limited to uh, giving birth to a new being, but rather to customize or personalize that individual. So this is why education forms part of the generating dimension of the parents. 
And we know that, well, some minister a short time ago said that education belongs to the state. And that is not the case because this forms part of the generative function of the parents because they generate persons. They have to personalize the baby that they've given birth to. They have to personalize that individual. They have to give it education. So this is why this fundamentally and essentially pertains to the field of the father and the mother that have engendered that child. So, well, as we'll see later on in the case of uh, St. Paul VI, the sixth, what he said is that this has to do with two issues, and that is the responsibility and the decision of transmitting life with generosity, that's the first issue, and also with, uh, well, faithfulness to one's own vocation, because sometimes we talk about vocation and we only refer to religious people or priests, but all of you have an vocation, each and every one of you. And in fact, Pope Francisco said, it's not that your life has a mission, your life is a mission. And uh, love is always related to a mission and to a commitment, because there are many people that have not yet discovered the mission of their lives. And well, as I say, an, a mission is involved with that is with uh, knowledge and respect for biological um, processes, and also with uh, well, with uh, the virtue of chastity that um, covers all approaches. So therefore, what you have to do well, this is the outcome of a weighted and generous deliberation that is not related to selfishness. And as we're going to buy two uh, beach houses, and as we have a very big uh, car. I don't know. Well, why not invest in resources? And well, this uh, has to be done personally and jointly by the spouses. And well, with uh, objective uh, motivations or reasons. And we have to be guided by um, properly formed conscience. And there are many issues here that we could spend uh, plenty of time on, but I'm afraid that we don't have enough time to do so. And then we have justified uh, reasons. Well, spouses can want to space or separate the births of their children. So it doesn't suffice for them to be justified motives, but rather what they should do is not to forge the conjugal act, as we'll see later on. In other words, that they be in agreement with the nature of sexuality that has been mentioned here. That is the natural law and the act of conjugal love. And uh, well, um, well, never forge, if uh, you are infertile, this doesn't uh, f falsify the act, but rather they have to become the administers, administrators of the plan of God, and they have to become um, people cooperating with the Creator. And yesterday, we, well, we mentioned something about resorting to the natural methods and the recognition of fertility is the Catholic uh, contraceptive method. And we were told, too, that this has nothing to do with anything. Because the let's say that contraception is a mindset issue. So I judge, I think, that for me, at this time, a son or a daughter would be something bad. And from the conjugal act, I'm going to subtract something that has to do with the uh, fecund dimension. So actively and consciously, I'm going to amputate that element without noticing that in the conjugal act, when I amputate the fecund element, I also reduce the unitary element because I said, I'm going to receive, do I receive everything from you? No, I'm going to receive everything from you except for your fecund, fecund capability. And do I surrender myself to you? No, well, yes, everything except for the fertility capacity. So this does not only harm the procreation aspect, it also harms the unitary aspect. I don't want your fecundity in a nutshell. So this is why it's much more important as you have a, well, this, well, this shouldn't happen if you've used your intelligence and uh, your willpower. So, well, the act is open to life. I surrender myself completely. Yes, and I also surrender my fecundity in yours too. But right now, well, well, and whatever nature has given us, but we, what we have explained is that women are not always fertile, although men are always fertile. And what I do is use um, our, my willpower because this allows me, allows me to avoid uh, forging the conjugal act without restricting any of its uh, characteristics. And we've already told that uh, children are always uh, like a gift. And uh, is there the right to have a child? No because it's always a gift. A son or a daughter is always a gift. So the spouses, can they do something to have a child? Of course, they are entitled to that, which is called the conjugal debit, I think. 
comfortable, the right to a gift, well, it's always a gift, really. And uh, the son or the daughter is the permanent testimony of uh, what the parents have. It's, uh, it recognizes uh, their love or acknowledges their love. And yesterday we could see how love reaches out through the children or continues through the children. And well, a child is not an instrumental asset. Well, having a child to calm an anxiety, or for instance, a family, I don't know, of well, a son dies, I said, okay, well, let's engender another one, as if uh, this uh, son were to be replaced by the new one. No, because a son is never an instrumental asset, and it's obviously not an element of ownership. It's always a gift uh, that we don't deserve, that goes beyond anything we might deserve. So this is why here there's a golden rule for the world of gynecology and the world of urology too. And uh, well, these uh, medical actions are perfectly legal. Those that help or assist appropriation, but whereas this is not the case of those that substitute these actions, because then the daughter or son is the outcome of the technique or the skills mm, mm, compared to the act of love. When we talk about ecology, like yesterday, when well we spoke with Dr. Rath about this, we spoke about eco-ethics. And yes, yes, in, yes, we t talk a lot about ecology. We talk a lot about respecting. So we talk about a lot about sustainability and about ecology in the Amazon. And uh, we mention ecosystems too. But sometimes we're not serious about our own human ecology, right? So therefore, this act, the human being or the suitable place to look at this world is within uh, whatever is related to an act of love of uh, the parents. And this is why what medicine can do is assist. It can assist that act of love. So what it can't come, what this can't come is from a technical skill. And this is a basic rule that appears continuously in the concepts that are managed by the church. We've seen the natural recognition methods or awareness methods. And I have five points. In other words, spouses learn and help each other to achieve self-control, virtue, and uh, the effort to establish love. Because if not, everything is done by the woman. And as we'll see later on, and well, uh, the uh, feminism that said uh, is that we have to liberate uh, women from motherhood so that uh, women can be free. And well, well, you've uh, liberated her from motherhood, but she's been, hasn't she been under the control of pharmaceutical industries throughout her entire uh, fertile period from the very beginning until she had to take the pill? Do you have, you have liberated her, but have you really and truly liberated women? Or has she had to pay for all this? Has she had to pay the pharmaceutical companies? That is the price of that liberty. However, what I can say is that uh, the, the women are fertile and so are men. But, well, as we saw before, due to objective and fair reasons, well, we, we shouldn't have another baby. I've seen women with uh, five children that are exhausted. And they say, look, no, you can't cope with anymore. You just can't. So something has to be done about that because well, psychology and everything also has its own limitations, doesn't it? Both have to put the means, <clears throat> not only the woman. When it, they, it fails, who is to blame? Well, the woman is to blame and penalized, by the way. Dialogue and understanding grow between them because they uh, demand uh, the agreement, mutual agreement of the moment of having intercourse. It demands dialogue and com understanding. They live helping each other, the virtue of chastity that make us be far from falling in, being selfish. I'm not looking for your good. I'm do not looking for your happiness. I look for, to my, for my own satisfaction. We can have uh, selfishness between both manipulation from the other, the use of the other, promotes the respect of man and woman, the mutual recognition, and looking for manifestations of love that not necessarily have to be genital, mutual respect. Methods that any people from any sort of training can learn how to recognize the fertility, self-observation we have been hearing about it these days, cost zero. 
and absolutely biosustainable. And both are in, in it, not only the one who, who pays. I have just 13 minutes left. What I've said is supported by the uh, teaching of, of the popes. Alongside of what we have been saying here, I have taken a text that I published uh, three years ago. Why the Pope Paul VI writes Humanae Vitae? Well, it appears as sort of conjugation of the constellations in several elements are appearing. As you know, or I will remind you, the 11th of October 1962, many of us were not yet born. We had the second Vatican Concil opened by John. St. John 23, whilst the Concile of 62 to 65 was achieved, the UN and WHO prepared the second international conference on population and development that was to be held in Belgrade in 1965. And in order for the Holy See to participate in this world conference on the UN and World Health Organization on Development Population, St. John 23rd called a com on, a com on a conference to see what the, was the position of the church at that point in time. They, have this, they had discovered the uh, contraceptive pill that was discovered in Mexico in the 50s. Regulatory men of the menstruation. It's marketed in the 60s in the United States, like with the name of Enovid and was approved in Mexico and Puerto Rico. So they have already made the woman be free from maternity. She could be released from maternity. So St. John 23 calls upon this uh, commission that was extended by Paul VI. And the council, when it deals about the family issues, you, there are notes, footnotes. And the Gaudis Pes has a note, the note five, number 51 at the foot, foot page, with more research, more deep research by mayor, by the Pope have been trusted for their study by the commission that studies the problems of the population, the family, and birth rate. So that when this commission has finished its work, the Pope can say his ruling the doctrine of the mastery, the sacred synod doesn't want to propose their immediately specific solutions. The issue of birth rate, maternity, lets the commission work on it and the pope shall decide. Well, yes, the commission presents three secret reports, one of the majority that was prone to separate the different dimensions of the conjugal act admitted the whole issue of the contraception. Another one of the minority that says that those issues are falsifying this uh, conjugal act and are breaking it from inside. And the third report from the majority, but that not, was not subscribed by the minority. And all this falls in upon the shoulders of St. Paul VI, the Pope. It's a relevant and fundamental decision. 1966. They present this report to the Pope, and the Pope writes uh, Humanae Vitae in 1968 and says as follows. We couldn't consider as definitive the co conclusions that the Commission had reached, not be without examining deeply the serious question, amongst other qu issues, because in the midst of the Commission, we didn't reach a full agreement of judgments concerning the moral rules to be proposed, especially because some solutions and some criteria were separated from the moral criteria doctrine on marriage proposed by the church constantly. That's why, having examined very carefully the documentation that we received, that was presented to us, and after a mature reflection and many prayers, we now want, by virtue of the mandate that Christ has trusted us with, give our response to these serious questions. 
the Pope says after this, I have to decide. And I do it being the successor of Peter, because we know it's a very, very serious question and very delicate question. And the Pope holds the proposal of the minority, accepts the proposal of the minority. And it's like an earthquake in the church that we haven't yet come out from. In 2018, and gave many ch- conferences from Humana Vitae, and a part of the church doesn't still uh, host this um, uh, teaching from Humana Vitae. They think that the Pope was be- go- went beyond, was wrong, and thus the Humana Vitae teaching is not yet accepted, although we know that both uh, John, Paul, John Paul II and Benedict VI and Franciscus do host this teaching from St. Paul VI and do explain it and how it has been something that has even given very many fruits of sanctity in the church. But it's not a peaceful uh, issue, not even outside the church, but in the midst of the church itself. It's a complex issue, by the way. And hence, we have the whole issue of Humana Vitae. That's why I now refer to the, the issue of the natural methods. I've got seven minutes left, one sentence of each one of these popes that has always followed, the, been firm defending the natural recognition of fertility or awareness of fertility as a human way, full, full way of living and sexuality. St. Paul VI talks about the human life has to be considered under biological perspectives, not only medical ones or psychological ones, demographic or sociological. But we have rather, in the light of a comprehensive vision of man and his vocation, goes beyond fragmentation of knowledge. I'm happy that this Congress is multidisciplinary. This means it wants to have a whole vision from all the scopes of knowledge. It talks about the characteristics of the conjugal love. It's a human love. It includes corporality. It is one of the big lacks of training in young people today. They don't realize that love includes their corporality as well. As well, It's not just a spiritual part. There is a bodily part as well. The young people don't understand the body. They don't understand its significance. They don't under, understand their its intelligibility. It's a love that is comprehensive, global, and delivers and receives everything, even the body, something that we don't give to our friends or to our brothers. It's loyal and exclusive out of that donation of the own corporality, because this love is always fertile. Although it doesn't gender, uh, generate children due to the age, when we see the elderly people, our relatives, how much love they generate and how much life, because love always generates life. When we feel loved, we realize that our life is growing, increases in degrees of vitality. The, mode, the most cruel mode of eliminating a person is making her perceive that nobody loves her. Very often I tell the young people when sometimes they complain, you are, although you have been adolescents in your t- and you are up to five o'clock in the morning waiting for your children, and the children come and they get angry because you're waiting for them. And I tell the young people, you have to thank God that somebody's waiting for you and is concerned by you because in Spain there are six million, million of homes that are monopersonal that are not expected by anyone. And you, nobody waits for them to reach, to come home, and that nobody's waiting for you. That's extremely sad that your parents are waiting for you because they love you. You are waited for, expected because you are loved, and they are concerned for you. That's why love, as I say, how much tenderness and love from the grandparents that very often are babysitting because the parents are working, and the task of grandparents is to. Uh, treated too well the children because, but maybe 
they are not fertile, the vitality of their bodies is very decreased. They keep on generating so much love. They are still so fertile in another level of fertility. A responsible paternity, this is what Humana Vita says, tells us. I'm not going into detail, but the, I'm going to tell something very important to the physicians. All this recognition, the Pope Paul VI uh, told the physicians to do that. We want now to encourage the scientific men, the physicians, the whole healthcare profession that can contribute to the good of the ma marriage and the family, the peace of consciousness. By binding the uniting uniting their studies, they want to clarify more deeply the favorable conditions to an, an honest regulation of human procreation. I, well, I don't like too much uh, human reproduction. This is incompatible. The man doesn't reproduce himself; he procreates. The reproduction is for animals. Mm, area of human reproduction, it's a red light that uh, it's turned on because we don't reproduce ourselves, we procreate. We generate persons that, are that cannot be repeated. It's an immense gift. And I want to, according to what uh, appears to 12 said, that the medical science is able to reach enough se secure basis for the regulation of birth based on the observation of the natural rhythms. I have to thank you being uh, coming from the church because you, you have done that, because those who want it, they, you, they can do it, thanks to all of you, because you took very seriously what the Pope said 23 years ago, 53 years ago, sorry. And I have heard to proposing people from all sorts of conditions, all types of formations of, of any latitude, that they are able to recognize the fertility and live fully the gift of uh, fertility and live in fullness without any falsification, the responsible paternity and maternity. And we have to thank you for that. I have one minute left. St. John, St. John Paul II talks about the same thing, the anthropological and moral difference between these uh, contraception and resourcing to natural methods. There you have the everything written on the human love. Dr. West from 72-74, the Pope had many uh, studies that collected in a vo volume. I see put here the figures where he indicates what, he, what he's talking about. The Evangelium Vitae as well, man and woman and man united in the marriage are associated to a divine work. By means of the creation act, they are open to a new life. Dignitas Persona in 2008, the origin of human life has its authentic context in adequate ecology in the marriage and the family, where it's generated by means of an action that does express the mutual love between man and woman, an act of an enormous anthropological density and where the gynecologists and urologists do not replace, but they do help when there, are, when there are difficulties, so that this act that expresses mutual love can take place, that is the conjugal act. Franciscus in Laudato, yes, that it's not an ecological, it doesn't see, mean green. It's exactly the human ecology some, means something very deep, the necessary relation with a human being with a moral law written in his own nature the natural law that we have been talking about these days, that is the ecology of man, because man uh, possesses a nature that has to respect that he can't manipulate as he wishes. We have to recognize that our own body places us in direct relation with the environment and with other living beings, the importance of corporality once again, the acceptance of your own body as a gift of God. It's necessary to host and accept the whole world as a gift from the father and a common ho home, whilst a rationale of the domain, or the dominant dominance on the own body, is transformed by the rationale of dominance on the creation. We have to learn how to receive our own body, take care of it, to respect its significance, and also the assessment of femininity or masculinity is necessary. In Amoris Laetitia, on the marriage says the same. 
the clergy has to make the spouses be generous. These are the words from Paul VI in the communication, communicating life. In agreement with the human and personal character of the conjugal lo love, the adequate f path for the family planning presupposes the consensus dialogue with consensus among the spouses, respecting times and the dignity of the members of the family. That's why it's necessary to rediscover the message of Humanae Vitae and the Familiaris Consortio, St. Paul the Sixth and St. John Paul, in order to counteract a mentality that sometimes is hostile or very often hostile to life. Amoris Laetitia 222, we have to promote the use of method based on the natural rhythms of fertility. There, you are there to do that. And those methods do respect the body of the spouses, encourage the effect among them, favor the education of a true freedom. That love becomes fertile, that's the, where the title comes from. And I finish with the new letter of 2017, these of the Catholic, they use the, well, it's a copy of Humanae Vitae, practically. The love that assumes the body language as an expression, at the same time, uniting and procreating. These are not, not two different actions, it's an act with two dimensions. This connection is intrinsic to the conjugal act. The man can't break it by own initiative as the contraceptive do, without contradict the dignity of the person and the inner truth of the love in the family. When there are justified moments, it's illicit that the couple may refrain from sexual relations in fertile periods identified by means of the natural methods of awareness of fertility. And this is the last slide, because this is not only for Catholic people. This is the beauty of the human dignity written in our bodies, written in our lives. That's why St. Paul II said that the gospel of life is for the city of men, for all. Respect, only respect of life can base and guarantee the most precious and necessary goods of the society as our democracy and peace. This presentation, I gave it to the organizing committee. You can take it if you want. It's available for you. If you go into depth, it's also in 2018 I wrote it. Uh, and I wrote an article on this aspect as well. I hope you can also take it from the library. And well, if this has helped you to shed light on this issue that is so essential and fundamental, and if you are able to realize that you manage very sacred things, uh, issues and prof deeply human things that when we are between ovaries and fallopian tubes, etc. And I think with the permission of the gastroenterologist, there is something more than just the bladder, gallbladder, because there is the human dignity is born there. Something that is so beautiful and infinite as a new human being comes from there. So go ahead with that task that is so beautiful and valid, precious. You will always have the help of the church and the, our support. And also, as a pastor of the church in Burgos, I thank you very much for everything you do to promote this human dignity that is also the dignity of the human being as image and of God. Thank you very much. We are very moved with this uh, thrust that given in this talk because if this meeting, international multidisciplinary meeting, is the fruit of a reflection on the, about that cry from Paul II at the end of Humanae Vitae, 
we wanted to give you this book from Carlos Soria from this campus where you have been so often. It's a fantastic book. Well, that presents each one of the trees that we were planting there. We practically have no time left. It has been a very intense day. But if there are some questions to close this session, and this is the next one, the following one. If some if we want to ask further questions, there, are, there is a little time for that. But we feel we have here a mission as physicians, gynecologists. That was the that request from 1968 in Humane Vitae from Paul VI that has not reached everybody. What is What do you recommend? I think there is... And it emerges as an atomic bomb, the whole doctrine of the theory of the body. All the gynecologists, we who work in health, there are many family doctors. What would be your recommendation in order to make a step ahead and give testimony of this whole issue? I was uh, remembering the words of um, St. Paul VI, and that is that people don't listen to the teachers anymore. And that is the case, they just pay attention to the witnesses. And uh, well, they listen to teachers to the extent that they are witnesses. And nowadays that there are so many means of disseminating things because you can do some good things that are very good, but sometimes they're unknown. And it's a shame that sometimes the media only refer to bad things. If you watch the news and uh, what you feel like doing is take uh, three Prozacs and go to bed because it seems that everything is bad, but there are many, many good things too. So I believe that, of course, the work that you people are doing is uh, extremely important. And uh, without uh, really knowing what you do explicitly, but in any case, the testimony, the testimony of so many couples, of so many uh, married people, that have learned these methods and who can give testimony of the abundance and the happiness they feel and how it makes them grow as a couple in conjugal love and how it uh, gives them, it makes them feel happy about uh, um, experiencing that uh, mutual gift as uh, was mentioned before. They are coached, they are accompanied and they are generating a company for other couples too. And I think that this testimony well, I think that uh, happiness is contagious, and you can tell when it's fake or when it's real. So when you see families and when you see people that look at this with happiness, I sometimes feel sad when in the Western countries, uh, well, I don't know, um, when you uh, uh, travel with uh, children on uh, public transport or you go to a restaurant or when they go to a church or to the parish, some people don't like them. And there are people who say, I... I, I, I try to avoid um, hotels where children are accepted. But in any case, if you take three pets, though, that uh, bark all night, you, they'd even give them a protein bone or whatever. So I think that the testimony, the testimony of the happiness of families, which is, well, you know, we're not in Alibaba's and, and uh, Cinderella's uh, country. There are many difficulties here, many problems. I remember that in Bilbao and uh, now in Burgos, we'll have to do the same. We got together with uh, people celebrating their wedding anniversaries, their silver wedding anniversaries. They used to come to the Basilica, and it was about 170 families that showed up. When you saw these older people that came along holding hands, they said, look, uh, Don Mario, we've uh, had lots of things happening in our lives. But how many gifts life has given us? And they come along with their children, their grandchildren, and then some of them have Alzheimer's, some of them could hardly walk. And I think that this is definitely worthwhile, in spite of the difficulties, because life is complex for everybody. But I think that it is worthwhile. And, uh, well, with your work, you make it be worthwhile. And you um, allow these families to enjoy something as holy and sacred as this vocation and marriage and, uh, well, motherhood and fatherhood. So I think that, above all, this uh, is a true testimony of what you are experiencing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Hans Tony has a question before we close. Well, well, your words of encouragement are for us, and I would like to recognize the work that you've uh, done 
because we secular people also have to understand this and have to take it on board. And possibly what we're also lacking is a little bit of support from the pastors. And as you've just done, well, in your comments, I think this is uh, very helpful because you are giving us uh, words of encouragement so that we can uh, all travel together. And above all, well, we need these testimonies and we need all these technicalities, but we need your support, and I'm very grateful to you on the personal front, and also I think that this is what the audience uh, thinks too. So thank you very much for coming here and for pointing out this testimony. Well, thank all you people very much indeed. Okay, well, we're going to close here. Can we finish? Yes, we can finish, right. Well, I would just like to say that at this session, we've had between one thing and another, we've had Instagram, online, in person. We've nearly had 1,000 people connected because there are lots of people that have registered that are streaming, and then, well, we're going to have this uh, on a live website. And we hope that all of these presentations will be included there so that we can disseminate them uh, for a long time. And that's all. Well, I wish you the very best, and I would like to thank you for your support. And I would like to remind you that nine o'clock here, we have a spectacular workshop that is called Sexuality Without Any Barriers, Love Without Any Limits, and How to Communicate the Beauty of Human Life here at nine o'clock. I won't be here because um, it's the it's uh, one of the Virgin's festivities, and I have to go and visit people in prison. I hope they will let me in and let me out. I'm going to celebrate a mass there or give mass with the inmates. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to the north of Burgos. But in any case, I've really enjoyed these two days and uh, definitely worthwhile. So you have all of our support and all of our encouragement. And let's only hope that you will continue along these lines because you're doing some very positive things. Thank you very much. And let's have a big round of applause for Monsignor Iceta. Cabica Jorge Escobar.